Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 78, a message which I am entitling, A Message for the Next Generation. A Message for the Next Generation. This is a much longer psalm than we have typically tackled in these Sunday services, and so I am going to read simply the first eight verses of Psalm 78, and I will leave you to read the balance on your own, although as we make our way through this message, we will cover many other verses besides these initial eight. A Maskell of Asaph. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, and that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Psalm 50, and then Psalms 73 to 83, are the Psalms of Asaph. There are 12 of them in all. Asaph is the second most frequently named author of a psalm in the whole book, David, of course, being by far the first. As I remarked, this is a longer psalm, and the emphasis is a typical one for the Jews. We find this both in the Old Testament and also in the book of Acts, where there is a sermon which is preached, and it essentially follows the same pattern. The people go back and they recount. They retell the goodness of God. They retell what God had done for them, most especially beginning with their enslavement in Egypt and how that God brought them out with a mighty hand, but as victorious and as powerful, as good as God was, as faithful as he was to his covenant, the people rebelled, they were stiff-necked, they walked with legs that were locked, determined to fight against everything that God was doing. The hero constantly is God, and the people are shown to be sinful, they are shown to be for what they are, and the emphasis is, do not be like them. It's easy for us to point fingers, most especially to point fingers over centuries or even millennia, to point fingers back to those who have gone before us and to say, oh, how rotten they were, how wicked, how foolish, how stubborn, how rebellious. And we miss that we are of the same cloth, that we are of the same character. It's the blindness, it's, it's, the, it's the speck in someone else's eye and when we have a beam, we have a whole log 
in our own eye that is prohibiting us from seeing anything whatsoever. Here is what we have taking place. But the emphasis is that we are to tell it on to the next generation. There is to be a constant emphasis, and this was laid very plainly upon Moses in the giving of the law, that the people, they were to talk about these things when they lay down, when they rose up, when they were walking along the road, they were passing to pass it along to the next generation. There was an urgency that people not forget. That word, remem the word remember and the word forget comes out repeatedly here. And let us consider what is taking place. Listen is how we begin this. And it reminds us of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, what the Jews refer to as the great Shema. It is that the word Shema means hear, and it's the beginning of that verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, or in this verse, listen. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. So many voices in our world, so many things that would beckon and that would want to grab us and pull us that we would listen to them. How broadcasting has multiplied exponentially in the past little while. It's not only just radio stations in their oldest, old fashioned type or television stations as it used to be 40, 50 years ago. Now there are so many different ways and advertisers that in every possible way you step out of your house and there is that beckon. You don't even have to step out of your house, but there are voices here. The voice of God through his servant is speaking to us. Listen, O oh my people, to God's instruction. Incline your ears that you might hear the words of his mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, utter dark sayings of old, of old. There is constantly in the scriptures a reverence, a respect that is not commonly known in our world to those who have gone before. Our world considers itself, by and large, to be the pinnacle of all that ever has been. We are the smartest, we are the most technologically advanced, we are this and that. I think that really all that we are is the most arrogant that have ever been. Yes, indeed, there are achievements and there are pursuits or there are advancements such as have not been before, but yet there is wisdom that comes to us from our fathers, grandfathers, and from the centuries past that we dare not, that we ignore to our own peril. We must not ignore what has been given to us from the past. Values and priorities, wisdom that comes to us, and wisdom that though certain things in our world do change, Yet, the principles and the underlying character that comes underneath it is of tremendous, tremendous value. Verse 3 says, Sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Once again, the respect that is due to those who have gone before us, that we don't say, oh, what did they know? They grew up in the dark ages, as it were. They didn't have the advantages. They didn't know what's before us now. I think that they knew far more than we give them credit for. And we need to hear the wisdom that comes from our ancestors, even as is here. 
Verse 4, we will not conceal them from their children, but tell them to the, tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. One of the greatest things that has been passed down to me from my grandparents and my parents are the accounts of when God's power has been so evident in their lives. Times back on the farm 80 years ago, when there was sure destruction of locusts that were coming across a field and they prayed and they interceded before God. That was all that they had to live on. And God did a mighty work so that there was nothing, no insects left there and the crop was all right. And others, other accounts of how that God met the need of his people. Those are stories that need to be told and reminded to the next generation. We keep on going through this, how that God established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, to the generation to come. Verse 6 is where I'm reading. That the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren, that they may arise and tell them to their children, generations down the line, that there be a concern for them. And verse 7 says, this is what they need to do, that they might put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Doesn't matter whether they got better hoes or whether they got better shovels, whether they got better understanding of how to grow their crops, that they would continue to put their trust in God, that their confidence would be in him, and that they would attend to his word, that they would respect his word, for if they lost that, it didn't matter whether they built marvelous technological wonders, if they forgot the Lord, then indeed all was lost and lost completely. The point is made in verse 8 that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. It's the customary recounting of the redemption of Israel out of bondage to the privileges of God's bounty. Now, here, it begins really in verse 12. And follow along with me very quickly as I make my way through this. And I want you to keep this in mind as you read in other portions of the scripture how that this story of redemption it's the great story, not only of the people becoming a nation in their own right, having grown, having multiplied there in Egypt under the blessing of God, though, as it were, in a furnace of affliction under slavery. It was the account of God bringing his people, going down into Egypt, just as he has come down into this world in Jesus Christ, to purchase a people for his own name. By his mighty works, he has come and demonstrated his power. He has shed his blood. So God went down into Egypt in his mighty power and through the shedding of blood on Passover to bring a people to himself. He takes them through the, the, the Red Sea and that is, as it were, their baptism. And he brings them to himself at Horeb or Mount Sinai. And he teaches them. There is a process of sanctification. It's one thing to be saved, to be redeemed. And for us to have our sins taken away and not accounted against us, the process of sanctification 
is God now changing our heart, fashioning us, so that it's not that we're constantly clamoring to sin once again, but that we realize the better way of walking with Christ, of trusting in him, attending to his word, and the very desire of sin is extracted from us. That is a part, that is a key part of sanctification, that we are made holy in every way, and that we avoid sin, that we turn away from it, that we naturally are repulsed by it, because we would never want to go back into that. That is sanctification. Verse 12 of Psalm 78, it talks about Egypt and the ten plagues. God wrought wonders before their fathers in the land of Egypt. Verse 13, he divided the sea. It speaks of the Red Sea and how that the people walked through on dry land. Verse 14 speaks of the good hand of God in leading the people on. By day they, they had a pillar of cloud, and by night there was a pillar of fire which showed them the way they were to go. Verses 15 and 16, there was the miraculous provision of water for the people that their thirst, even in the wilderness, in a dry and barren land, that the people might be satisfied. But yet, verses 17, 18, 19, and 20 speak of how that the people tested the Lord, how that they rebelled against him, and they said, God has brought us out into this wilderness. What are we to eat? Can he provide food even as he has provided water. And verse 18, it says, they, they wanted food according to their desire. They were asking for food according to their desire. It was not good enough that God gave them bread, the manna. There were evil desires, and they said, Lord, we don't want what you have provided. We have other desires. We remember those things that we ate back in Egypt. Yes, we were slaves back then, but they were conveniently forgetting that. Is that not the same for us, even as we look down our noses at these people? Is that not the same as us, that we say, Lord, we realize that you have provided for us, but it's not what we had in mind. It's not what we would choose off of the menu. We want something more. We want something different. Here these people, they tested God and they grumbled against God. God heard them. God was angry with those people. God is not deaf. They did not believe, verse 22, and they did not trust in his salvation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, we read the Apostle Paul saying about the Old Testament and what took place in Old Testament times. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. How that speaks to each and every one of us. These things were written for our instruction. And the question is, are we getting it? Are we laying a hold of the instruction that is right before our very eyes that we should be wise? One thing to learn from our own mistakes, it's better to learn from the mistakes of others. For us to immerse ourselves in the word of God and that we learn from the example and that these things which were written for our instruction, that we take the instruction that is meant for us. Well, these people, they did not believe 
and they did not trust in God's salvation. They were stiff-necked and they were rebellious and yet see the kindness of God, see his provision. Verse 23 and the verses that follow. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. How good God was yet to those people who rebelled against him. Manna and meat within easy reach of them. But yet the people continued to sin against God. Verse 32. In spite of all this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works, the works which God had so graciously done for them. First of all, in bringing them out of their bondage, there was no one beating upon their backs. There was no one saying, look, we're not going to give you any resources, but yet you still have to make the same amount of bricks that you've ever done before. There was none of that. There was no one saying, okay, all of the male boys that are born to you, they have to be thrown into the Nile River. There was none of that. The people were under God's good hand. God was providing for them. God was leading them forward. God had not abandoned them. And yet, and yet, verse 32 says, they still sinned against him. But verse 34 and following says that when he killed them, then they sought him. They returned and searched diligently for God. They remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Only for a time. Verse 36 says, They deceived him with their mouth, lied to him with their tongue, for their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful to his covenant. Verse 38, But he... But God, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. He often restrained his anger and did not arouse all his wrath. Thus he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. And verse 40, how often? They rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Again and again they tempted God and pained the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. They did not remember. How often? We look at that and just recently I've been reading again through those wilderness wanderings. And you think, fellas, haven't you learned anything? How is it that you so quickly turn away? And as quick as I point a finger at others, it comes back to myself. And it comes back to our time, how that we quickly turn away and we say, oh, well, this is a different situation. Uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't apply to what was there before. And we forget the goodness of God and we do not understand. Look, look, look here. How that God was kind and gracious and continuing to work out his plan. What was his plan? To bring a people to himself? Yes, that was a part of it. He was bringing, as he had promised, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would establish their descendants in the land of promise. He was bringing that about, but most especially the promise that he had made to Adam and Eve when they fell into sin, that he would bring a redeemer, that he would bring one who would satisfy the need of the heart, not simply the need for manna or the need for meat or the need for drink, for, for water out of a rock, he would bring one 
And he, the, the writer, Asaph, comes to this towards the conclusion of Psalm 78. And he speaks in verse 68 that God chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has founded forever. The psalmist does not delight in the house of Levi, but he delights in the house of Judah and in the tribe of Judah. Who would come of the line of Judah? Yes, David would. It says, he also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From the care of the ewes with suckling lambs he brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. But there would be one who David would call Lord, and that is who the psalmist is most especially working towards, that God chose Judah as the tribe through which Messiah would come, and the house of David through which Messiah would be born. And verse 72, the final verse of the chapter says, So he shepherded them. God patiently bore with them because he was working out his plan to bring Messiah into this world according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. God continues to work out his plans against all that we throw at him, against all that we dig in and re resolve ourselves. No, Lord, not on my watch. That's not happening. God is continuing to work out his plan and to accomplish his purposes. Best that we just lay our very lives before him and that we trust in him and that our confidence be in him and that we say, Lord, truly be God over all. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your word. And even as we hear from Psalm 78, that call, listen, listen. So Lord, may it be that our hearts, not just our physical ears, but our hearts would hear once again of all your goodness and that we would praise you that we would attend, and that we would follow hard after you. So work in our hearts these mercies we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.